Hi, I'm Lorenzo Ciardo, a researcher at the University of Oxford, and I talk about semi-definite programming and linear equations versus homomorphism problems, which is a joint work with Stanislav Zivny. The context is that of constraint satisfaction problems, which have problems of the following general form. I have a set of variables, I have a set of values that I can associate with the variables. Is there any assignment meeting a given list of uh, constraints? So for example, if the variables are x, y, z, and the values are integers mod p, and the constraints are linear, then what I get is linear equations. Or suppose that the variables are vertices of a graph, and the values are colors, and the constraints are expressions of the form adjacent vertices should get uh, different colors, then what I obtain is graph coloring. Okay, so it should be convenient to adopt the following um, homomorphism definition for CSPs in this talk. So I fix a relational structure A, which is the template, and it encodes the values and the form of the constraints. And then the problem is given as input another relational structure X, which is the instance, um, find a homomorphism from X to A, uh, where a homomorphism is a relation preserving map. And up to polynomial time equivalence, it is actually enough to assume that X and A uh, have a unique binary relation. So they are uh, digraphs. Okay, so linear equations is in P. Graph coloring is NP hard as long as there are at least three vertices. So um, a main question we may ask is what is the complexity of CSP? How does it depend uh, on the template? And other questions are what is the power of algorithms? for solving CSPs and uh, what are the limits of algorithms for solving CSPs? And in this talk, I'll focus on the third of these questions here. So speaking of algorithms, I will now present uh, two broad algorithmic models. One is based on semi-definite programming. And uh, broadly speaking, the idea is that I want to assign to the variables so that, or the CSP um, some vectors living in an n-dimensional real space. And then I want to turn the constraints into a relaxed version that corresponds to orthogonality conditions between these vectors. And the goal is to spot um, constraints that are not simultaneously satisfiable uh, by looking at impossible configurations of vectors in this space. Okay, so this model here is known to solve precisely a class of uh, a fragment of CSPs known as uh, bounded with CSPs that have many different uh, definitions. This was shown by Bartok Kozik, see also Tsarias Um It also uh, solves precisely those CSPs that are robustly tractable, so such that if you give me um, uh, an instance that is almost satisfiable, I can give you in polynomial time an almost satisfying, satisfying assignment. This was also shown by Bartok Kojic. And finally, it is known that um, the whole class, the whole model of semi-definite programming actually collapses to one specific algorithm, the standard semi-definite programming algorithm, which I will write as SDP in this talk. This was shown by Tapper Givni. Uh, which means that taking um, constant or even polynomial levels of the Lasser uh, sum of squares uh, refinement does not actually increase the power. So the set of CSP solvable uh, by, by the technique is actually the same. Okay, the other class um, is Gaussian elimination or, or more precisely an abstraction of it. So here the idea is that I start with my CSP um, I consider an equivalent system of linear equations over zero one where one means that I have an, uh, an assignment variable to value and zero means that I don't. And then of course, I cannot solve this system of linear equations uh, in polynomial time uh, over zero one, most likely. So I relax it over the integers. And um, well, unsurprisingly, the, the class of CSPs that can be solved via this approach are those that behave like linear equations. Okay, so essentially, um, these two models are enough for, for covering the whole uh, tractability in the CSP world. And this is because if a CSP does not have bounded width, so if it is not solvable by semi-definite programming, then it was shown by Bartok Kozik and independently Bulatov that it can simulate linear equations mod P. And also we now know that there's a dichotomy for, for CSPs, uh, P time versus uh, NP complete. This was shown by Bulatov and Zhuk independently, and both the algorithms of Bulatov and Zhuk uh, essentially work as a 
complicated reduction to subproblems that even have um, bounded width or uh, are akin to equations mod p. And it is conjecture that some much simpler combination of the two models could actually be enough to cover all tractable CSPs. So this conjecture has appeared in different form in the literature, and it was finally formalized by Dalmau Opschall. The goal of this work is to explore the limits of the STP plus Gaussian elimination model, so the combination of the two models, and in particular to obtain uh, lower bounds against this combined model. These lower bounds are going to involve um, a generalized version of CSPs known as promise CSPs. So here, um, wh whose description is the following. So I take two sets of constraints, one in a strong form, the other in a weak form. Um, I am promised that the strong constraints are satisfiable, and the goal is to find an explicit assignment that satisfies uh, the weak ones. And again, it shall be convenient to, um, to use a homomorphism form. So I have two relational structures, A and B. A encodes the strong constraints, B encodes the weak constraints, um, which means that A homomorphically maps to B. Again, without losing generality, we can assume that both A and B are actually digraphs. Um, and the problem is, given an input X, such that X is promised to me to be homomorphic uh, to A, find an explicit homomorphism from X to B, which exists as uh, homomorphisms compose. Okay, so why promise CSPs? Well, the main reason is that the complexity of CSPs is known. There is a dichotomy, P versus uh, NP complete. The boundary of this dichotomy is well known, is uh, universal algebraic. On the other hand, um, the complexity of promise CSPs is wide open. There is not even uh, a dichotomy conjecture at the present time, which means that in principle, I can find lower bounds to relaxations uh, involving promise CSPs whose complexity is, um, is not known. And this is precisely what I'm going to, to do now. So examples of promise CSPs are approximate graph coloring. So I give you an n colorable graph and I want you to find an n prime, uh, an explicit n prime coloring. And the complexity of this uh, of this problem is conjectured to be uh, np hard for every fixed n less than or equal to n prime, at least three. Um, if there are two, uh, it, this is trivially tractable. And this is uh, a conjecture that essentially is due to Gary Johnson. Uh, Johnson. And the extension of approximate graph coloring to um, arbitrary undirected graphs. Right. So, so we can see approximate graph coloring as a promise CSP uh, involving two structures A and B that are cliques. And if I extend the problem to two structures that are underrated graphs, I obtain uh, approximate graph homomorphism. So I have uh, graph X, I'm promised that X maps to A, and I want to find a, an explicit homomorphism from X to B, where X, A, and B are undirected graphs. And also in this case, this problem here is conjectured to be NP-hard in all non-trivial cases, which means whenever A and B are non-biparted. If they are biparted, uh, the problem is trivially tractable in polynomial time. And this conjecture is due to Brackensick and Guruswami. Okay, so the main result uh, of this work is the following. So the combined model, semi-definite programming plus Gaussian elimination does not solve approximate graph homomorphism and thus in particular approximate graph coloring. I will now say a few words um, on the structure of the proof. So the overall idea is to start with an SDP solution and compress it into a space, a lower dimensional space by getting rid, so quotienting out all the symmetries of the problem, so the instance end of the template. The second step will be to find an alternative basis for this lower dimensional space, such that in this basis, the SDP constraints actually look like LP constraints. And then in this new basis, it shall be easier to recover acceptance of both parts of the algorithm, so the semi-definite programming part and Gaussian elimination part, or certain instances that have a high chromatic number, right? Which means that the algorithm will accept these highly chromatic instances, but since they have a high chromatic number, they should be rejected. And this will mean that they are full in instances and then uh, the algorithm does not solve the problem. Okay, and in order to, uh, to find the alternative basis for the lower dimensional space, we, we will make use of an algebraic object 
um, known as association schemes. And in order to recover acceptance of the algorithm uh, in the new basis, uh, we will make use of the character tables of the association schemes. So let me now describe the proof in a bit more detail with a concrete example. So now I have um, a concrete CSP. Uh, this is my instance X. This is my template A. Um, so X is clearly three colorable. So there exists a homomorphism from X to A, which corresponds, for example, to coloring X1 in red, X2 in green, X3 in red, X4 in yellow. Um, and now I want to encode this homomorphism here as a matrix. So this is going to be a big block matrix uh, whose blocks are indexed by pairs of vertices of X. And the entries in each block are indexed by pairs of colors, so pairs of vertices in A. And how do I fill this matrix here? Well, I start with a one-hot encoding of the, of the function f. Right? So for example, v1 is the vector corresponding to f of x1, which is red. So it's the vector 1, 0, 0. v2 corresponds to green, so 0, 0, 1, and so on. And then I take the outer products of these vectors here, so vi times vj transpose, and that is going to be my xi, xj block. And I obtain something like this. Okay, now I stare at this matrix here, and I want to collect all possible information about it. So, for example, I may notice that diagonal blocks are diagonal matrices, because they are outer products of um, um, a vector like this. Um, also, if xi, xj is an edge of, of x, then the corresponding block um, is a valid A coloring, right? So, so the support of the block is inside the, the DSNC matrix of, uh, of A. Uh, trivially, the entries in every block sum up to one. If I consider the row sums, these are constant horizontally. And similarly, the column sums are constant vertically. All entries are non-negative. And finally, the matrix is positive semi-definite. OK, so the first five. Uh, of these conditions here are just linear equations. So I may want to solve them over Z. And this is precisely uh, the abstract form of, Gaussian elimination, of the Gaussian elimination algorithm. Um, the sixth condition is an LP condition. The seventh is an SDP condition. So overall, I may solve all of these conditions here over R by using an SDP solver. And this is the standard semi-definite programming algorithm. OK, there's a little technicality when I combine the two, because in order to make the algorithm stronger, I want that the support of the Gaussian elimination algorithm should be inside um, the support of the SDP. But I'm going to ignore this uh, detail for now. So this is the situation. And um, it's not hard to check that SDP solutions are invariant under automorphisms of both x and a. Or more precisely, uh, consider an automorphism of x, this one in red, and an automorphism of a in green. Um, we may want to uh, permute the entries in every block according to the green automorphism and permute the blocks according to the red automorphism. And what we obtain is still an SDP solution. So if we take the average uh, of all these solutions um, over all automorphisms, what we obtain is something that is invariant under the automorphism groups. So let's try to exploit this fact here. So the automorphism group of a digraph acts uh, on pairs of vertices via the entry-wise action. So G acting on x, y is equal to G of x, G of y. So consider the set of orbitals of Vx square under this action here. Let's call it O of x. Um, if we take the tensor product between O of x and O of a, this is going to give me a set of generators, a basis for the space of matrices that are invariant under both um, out of x and out of a. And then the compression step I was mentioning before simply consists in expressing uh, the matrix M uh, found by the SDP relaxation in this basis here, thus obtaining a compressor presentation M prime. OK, but there's a problem here. So while the equality constraints and the uh, LP constraints of the matrix MF um, are preserved by this um, compression, the spectral properties of M are modified. Right. So how do we actually check whether M is an SDP solution? How do we check that M is uh, positive semi-definite? And the idea is to 
uh, look at uh, the, the tensor product between the orbitals, the orbital sets, as an algebraic object, um, in particular, the object of association scheme. Okay, so association schemes are a beautiful object in uh, representation theory and algebraic combinatorics. I will now give the, the definition and the, the most basic uh, properties of them. So an association scheme is just a set of uh, Boolean matrices uh, square Boolean matrices of the same size, satisfying a few properties. So one of them needs to be the identity. If I sum them all, I obtain the all one matrix. Um, the transpose of any matrix in the scheme is still in the scheme. The product of two matrices in the scheme belongs to the linear span of the scheme. And finally, uh, these matrices commute. Okay, so the, the linear span of the scheme is known as the Bose-Messner algebra of the scheme. And it's it's not hard to show that um, S, so the, the set of matrices in the scheme, forms a basis for, for the linear span B. And this basis consists of uh, sure orthogonal uh, elements, which means that the sure product is the n-wise product. So, so these matrices here are um, orthogonal under this product, and they are sure idempotent. And this is just because they are 0, 1 matrices. OK, this is uh, easy to check. But the surprising point is that uh, for every association scheme, I can find a dual basis, a second basis. Uh, let's call it E. So this is a basic for uh, a basis for the Bose-Messner algebra B, and it consists of orthogonal matrices. So this time orthogonal according to the standard matrix product rather than the sure product. And the elements of this basis are Hermitian and idempotence, again, uh, according to the standard uh, matrix product. OK, so I have these two bases. So uh, I must have a change of basis matrix, which is known as the Carter table for, for the scheme. OK, so why am I talking about this? Well, um, suppose that the digraph, a digraph X is uh, generously transitive, which means that um, for every pair of vertices, there is some automorphism that switches them then um, its orbital set is an association scheme. So this is the connection. So if both X and A are, are generously transitive digraphs, um, suppose that M prime is the compressed representation of the matrix M, and suppose that C and C tilde are the character tables for the schemes corresponding to X and uh, to A respectively. Then uh, the spectrum of the matrix M consists of the entries of the matrix C M prime C tilde transpose. Right? So, so the spectrum of M is equal to the entries of the matrix obtained by taking M prime, the compress, uh, the, the, the compress matrix of M, and then pre-multiplying times uh, the Carter table of X and post-multiplying times the transpose of the Carter table of A. And the proof of this fact here um, is just obtained by working instead of the primal basis, which is the, the natural one, um, in the dual basis of the scheme given by the tensor product between the orbital sets of X and of A. Okay, so as a result, uh, we have that M is a positive semi-definite if and only if this product here is entry-wise non-negative. But now let's look at this um, equivalence here. And uh, let's notice that on the left-hand side, there is uh, an SDP constraint, so M uh, is positive semi-definite. On the right-hand side, there is an LP constraint. So this matrix product needs to be entry-wise non-negative, which means that we have turned the SDP constraints into something which is uh, LP. And also, in the dual basis, um, acceptance of the Gaussian elimination part of the algorithm is naturally recovered. I'm not going to give details of this, but um, the point is that we don't need to, to worry about the Gaussian elimination part of the algorithm when we work in this dual basis here. There are also two problems, though. So the first is that X and A need to be uh, both generously transitive. This property is not true in general. And also, uh, we need to know their character tables. So this matrix product here involves C and C tilde, which are the character tables of uh, X and A. All right, so how did we solve this? So, well, first, um, Regarding A, this is not a big issue. So, so recall that here the, the, the goal is to show that SDP plus, plus the Gaussian elimination algorithm does not solve uh, approximate graph coloring, which is parameterized by two undirected graphs, A and B. It turns out that we can always assume without losing generality that A uh, is a knot cycle 
and B is a clique. Um, and well, odd cycles are, so the, the, the automorphism group of an odd cycle, uh, of a cycle in general is the dihedral group. So if I have two vertices, they are always switched by a reflection, which means that the graph is actually generally transitive. Um, moreover, uh, let's look at the orbitals. So there's going to be the diagonal orbital with uh, uh, constant tuples, and then all other orbitals, provided that C, uh, provided that P is prime, which we can always assume, um, are just copies of CP. So they are isomorphic to the cycle itself. But then this means that the character table is rather easy. So it just contains uh, the adjacency spectrum of, uh, of odd cycles, which is well known. Okay, it's going to be a bit more tricky for X. So here we want that the graph, we want to choose something that is um, generally transitive, of which we know as much as we can of the corresponding scheme. And also we want that the chromatic number is big so that it's going to be a full in instance. And it turns out that a, a good choice is given by Knesset graphs. So, well, first their chromatic number is, is unbounded. Also the, uh, the automorphism group is just a symmetric group. Uh, and from this, it's easy to show that the graph, uh, the, the Knesset graphs are uh, generally transitive. The orbitals turn out to be isomorphic to a class of graphs known as generalized Johnson graphs. Here you see some examples of them. So they're graphs parametrized by three numbers, n, k, and i. The vertices are subsets of a set of n, n elements of size exactly k. And two such vertices um, are adjacent if and only if their, the intersection of the corresponding sets has precisely i elements. All right, and the, the Carter table of this uh, object here is uh, well studied. So it, it contains the Carters of uh, a scheme known as the Johnson scheme. And using known properties of this object uh, and, and uh, in, a, in a quite technical way that I'm not going to give details uh, about, we were able to show that Knesset graphs are accepted by uh, the algorithm and thus they are uh, full in instances, uh, which, which concludes the proof. Okay, and finally, this is the list of references that I mentioned in this talk.